I bought this height adjustable desk a couple of months ago and it works with this little handle. You stick it in the side over here and it's a little bit hard to get it in there and I would occasionally turn it the wrong direction. You know, I wouldn't remember if I should turn it forward or backwards because I design machines for a living. For example, I custom built that robot you see back there to a man with a hammer, everything is a nail. And I, I looked at this desk and I thought, you know, I can design a mechanism that will automatically lift it up and down for me. I'll have a little button in the front, push up and down, and that would solve all of my problems. It will be easy to lift, it would lift quickly, and I could just push a button. But then I started thinking about my design process and I went, okay, slow down. Uh, that would take a lot of time and a lot of effort. What's the problem you're trying to solve? Well, I would love it if the desk could go up and down a little faster. And also I don't want to have to think about which direction I'm supposed to turn it because for whatever reason I keep forgetting. So, okay. I decided to write it on there. Okay. This direction makes the desk go up. This direction makes it go down, but how do I make it go up and down faster? Well, I happen to have a tool in my shop that already has a motor with a button and I could put that in there. Okay, so now I have a really quick way to lift the desk up and down and this costs nothing. I already own this, but then I had one more problem. I don't want to lose this. If I put it down anywhere else in the shop, I'm not going to keep track of it. So what do I do? Well, maybe I could 3D print a little holder that can go on the side and just screw it in. And then I thought, actually, no, I don't need to 3D print something. This is me working my design process backwards. This is not normally how I do it. The rest of the video is about how I normally do it. So I thought, okay, wait a minute. I don't need to 3D print something. Really, I just need a cup. I just need something that will hold this. And I want it to be relatively small. And then I thought, wait a minute. Actually, I just need to hold this. Like that's the actual problem I'm trying to solve. I need this to stay close to the desk. How do I do that? Well, I have a drill. What if I made a hole right here to hold it? This is a perfectly sufficient solution for what I wanted. Certainly I could have spent more money and bought a desk that already had the mechanism built in. I could have spent far more hours designing a more complicated solution. But in the end, all I really needed to meet my needs was a hole. So my goal today is to show you how I take concepts like this and apply them more systematically to all of my projects. Defining the problem well is just the first step in a series of steps that I've developed, which I call my Dr. Farr method. And since I'm using the PC for more than half of that process, I've set this mock desk up in the shop. This is basically a replica of what my office looks like. This is not normally in the workshop. Now Hewlett Packard is a sponsor on the channel. And when I told them about this particular video, they agreed to not only sponsor the video, but let me borrow this Z4 workhorse of a machine here. So we get a special treat. Since all my projects start with the PC anyway, let's take a look at the hardware and then we'll get into my whole design process. All right, let's have a look inside. Now, one of the first things that I thought was really neat was the toolless entry. There's nothing better than not having to look for a screwdriver and make sure it's the right size and all that good stuff. Now, I'm not a computer geek, but I do understand the technology well enough to tell you the parts that matter to me. So when I looked inside, one of the first things I noticed was there's a whole lot of fans in there. They're oriented in such a way to direct the airflow to optimize the cooling. I won't get into all the details of what I found, but it's really neat. So these parts also pop out without tools. So yeah, make a little room here for my shelf. So there are a couple of fans built into that. Here we have an A6000 graphics card. This is a high-end graphics card. A single A6000 graphics card is enough to do the kind of work that I'm doing. But the fact that you can add a second one in here lets you know just how much capacity there is to expand this machine. Over here we have our hard drive space. The current setup allows you to expand up to 92 terabytes, which is <laughs> ridiculous by today's standards. Uh, maybe next year it'll be more. And behind this thing, we have our Intel Xeon processor. This is the W5 series. I'll put the exact model on the screen for you, but it's got 16 cores, 32 threads. You can get the W7, 24 cores, 48 threads. Like it is ridiculous. Now everybody doesn't need this much power, but if you have workflows like I do, where you're doing simulation, you have rendering, you, you have large 3D model assemblies. And especially when I'm in Premiere Pro editing 
360 footage on top of 4K footage, and then it's sped up. That is really demanding on the PC. So for me, it's worth it to invest more in my processor and my graphics card to get the best possible performance. Okay, there's one more thing I wanna show you about this machine. The machine we're gonna be working with today has 128 gigs of RAM, but you can upgrade that to 512 gigs of RAM. <laughs> 512 gigs of RAM. You can get 92 terabytes of storage if you want from this machine. So the most important thing that I'm trying to communicate here is this machine is configurable up to ridiculous levels. You can get the machine you need with HP. So I'm just gonna say thank you to HP for making this video possible. I'll put a link in the description so you can find out more information and select an HP for yourself. So now that you've seen the hardware, let's dig into how my projects get started. The first thing that I do before I start any work is I reset my workspace, declutter anything that has gathered from the previous day and get back to my optimized workspace. A couple times a year, I will rethink my whole setup, both in the shop as well as at my desk. Is there anything in the shop or on my desk that's not essential? So everything that you see here is stuff that I use every single day and it's important enough that I decided it should stay in my work envelope. Any extra things will slow you down and get in the way, making your work less efficient. So I've got a pad for scribbling down, quick sketches I might have in my head, some image or shape that I'm trying to conceive. It helps to just scribble it down on a piece of paper or do some basic math. I have a calculator for more advanced math, calibers for obvious reasons, same with the tape measure. This weird looking tool, I made specifically for the camera. It's so that I can hit the autofocus from further away. USB ports are important because I'm constantly plugging in cameras, SD cards, things like that. Same with headphones, because I'm constantly recording and editing video, I wanna be able to listen to it both with headphones on or with the, the sound bar without the headphones on. These two devices over here, I use this, a Shuttle Pro V2 for editing in Adobe Premiere Pro. This is much faster, in my opinion, than using the keyboard. And all those keys have been pre-programmed for the stuff I normally use the keyboard for. And that way I don't have to move my hand back and forth. It's efficiency, right? The same with SolidWorks. Uh, this is better designed for 3D modeling. I'll put links to all this stuff in the description if you wanna look this stuff up. But uh, this is the 3D connection mouse, and I use that for SolidWorks. And that's basically it. Uh, I do have this which is a new tool that I'm testing out. It came with my touchscreen monitor, so I don't know if I love this yet or not. I mentioned the touchscreen monitor. Actually, both screens are touchscreens, and that's because I've developed some wrist pain over the years, and I've tried all sorts of tools to, to compensate for that. I tried the left-handed mouse for a while, the trackball, the vertical mouse, like you name it, I tried it. And in the end, I've enjoyed the workflow with the touchscreens better in terms of the least amount of pain and the most productivity but there's a significant premium to buy a 4K touchscreen. So I am not recommending that as part of your workflow. That's just something that has worked for me. The only other thing that I use regularly would be these cables that I have laying on top of the PC. In my office, the PC is under my desk, but this is in the same position because I have so many old hard drives with everything from old 3D models to old uh, photos and video clips. I need to access that stuff pretty regularly. And so I need cables like this. I have a couple of different versions to plug in all the various uh, hard drives. It turns out that HP has a hot swappable insert that they install in some of their machines. You just you know need to specify you want it. And you can actually plug the hard drive into a slot, you know, custom made for exactly that purpose. Such a cool upgrade. I wish I had known about that. I would have one that would resolve that problem. I wouldn't be knocking the cables out and the, the various, uh, clumsiness that comes with trying to fumble with cables and plug all that stuff in. The most important thing you need to get from this is that your entire space should be reevaluated and clean. That goes from a workshop as well as my office. Every tool gets scrutinized, you know, a couple of times a year to decide, do I still need this thing? I mean, even the keyboard could be on the chopping block. Maybe I could do voice to text. I may not need to type. I have a touch screen and I have a touch keyboard. Maybe that's sufficient. I have extra keys here that can be pre-programmed. So if there are just a few keys that I need this for, I can put them here. You can push the keyboard away. Or maybe you decide you still really need a keyboard. But the whole point is, reevaluate every tool and decide, is that really the best way to get the job done? 
and the same in my workshop. I also sort my tools from most important to least important and organize them accordingly. So tools that I'm using every couple of minutes get hung on a wall and they're very close to where they frequently get used. Tools that I use maybe once a year are put in a drawer and they're tucked away in such a way that it's a little more difficult to get to it, but that matches the fact that I use it very infrequently. If I'm using this tool less than once a year, I might consider whether it's even worth keeping it. Perhaps I should sell it and get rid of it. I don't actually need that tool. And that frees up space for tools I actually use. So this is the kind of thing you wanna think through. And along with that, I sweep the floor, I keep my benches decluttered for reasons I think that are probably obvious. It just makes your whole workflow uh, a lot faster. It's easier to find tools on and on. Once the workspace is ready to go, we can start pushing that project forward. And every project starts with an idea, right? In my case, there are two major sources for that. In a professional setting, I'm not giving an idea as much as someone gives me a problem. This is a thing that needs to be solved figure it out. On the other side of that would be my YouTube channel where I talk about engineering or design and build projects I'm interested in working on. Now I've made a whole video about how I do engineering on the commercial side of things called 18 engineering tips and tricks, something to that effect. I'll put a link in the description for you so you can go check that out. In this video, I'm gonna steer more towards my design process for YouTube since I've already covered the other stuff. My YouTube ideas can come from pretty much anywhere. I mean, some things are sent to me via you guys where I'll get you know, comments and emails. Sometimes I'm watching another YouTube video and there's some detail or something that comes up. I get curious about it. I start exploring it. Sometimes I'm walking through a building and I see infrastructure or something interesting and I go, wow, how did they do that? Why did they do it that way? And then the idea is sparked. So it literally could come from just about anywhere. Once I have an idea, then I kick into what I call my Dr. Farm method. At the beginning of the video, you watched me work through a real problem that I was trying to define well. And that's what you want to do. You want to be as specific as you can, but you have to be careful here because it's easy to bake in a, a preconceived solution into the way you ask the question. And you also need to define your constraints because uh, solutions that work in some conditions may not fit all of your constraints and then you need to weed those out as well. So you need constraints and you need to define the problem. Here's an example I used in a previous video. I could define the problem as, I want to design a more efficient lawnmower. Or I could define the problem as, I want to shorten so many acres of grass in so many minutes. The first one gives you all sorts of preconceived ideas about what a lawnmower should look like and how you should go about shortening the grass. You might be focused on changing bearings and improving the motor and improving gas efficiency and all these things that are very specific to your idea of a lawnmower as it is at that moment. And the other one opens up many more opportunities, right? Maybe you don't even need live grass. Maybe you could rip out all the grass and put turf down and now you've got a green lawn that never grows. Is that a good solution? Well, now we need to think about our constraints. Maybe you want live grass and that's important to you. Oh, okay, we want live grass. We could spray it with a chemical that makes it stop growing. And now you need to think about your other constraints. Do you have any other ones? If the chemical makes the grass a little brown, this is how you work through the problem. You think about your constraints, you define the problem well, and then you can start working on your solution. Once I've defined the problem, I move into research. Now research is me doing all of my homework. I wanna know, does this product already exist? Am I reinventing the wheel? You definitely don't wanna waste time redoing someone else's work unless the whole point is to learn about that process yourself. And I frequently do that on YouTube. I've designed and built robots, CNC machines, all sorts of complicated things. And many of those things already exist. You can go buy a robot and it would have saved me a lot of work and a lot of effort. I mean, I would have probably spent more money, but you get the idea. There are uh, problems and constraints. Maybe budget is, can, is a constraint that makes me want to build my own. That wasn't the case in, for me with building a robot. I wanted to build a robot specifically because I was interested in the challenge itself. What does it take for me to make a full-size industrial robot in my home shop? Can I even do it? And that's what I was interested in. I didn't even care that much what it could do, but I decided on capabilities and design constraints so that I would have a target to work towards. And then once the robot was built and I proved it could do that stuff, then I was done. So your goals can vary a lot, right? And you just need to make sure that you're solving the right problem. 
doing your research is an important part of seeing whether someone else has already solved that problem. And another thing that can be really difficult is sometimes someone has solved the problem, but in a different industry. For example, this tool that you want to create may already exist in an area you're not familiar with. And therefore you don't know what this thing is called and you're searching in the wrong place. So sometimes it helps to pull back and think about other professions and how they might have a task that's similar to yours. For example, if I need to design a tool that needs to reach into a tight space without damaging parts that are around it, surgeons have to do something very similar. They have to reach into someone's torso working in tight spaces without damaging the organs around the, the organ they want to work on. This can be really challenging, but it's worth the time to try to take a minute to think about what other professions do and see if you can't find a tool that maybe you don't know the name of, but again, they have already solved the problem you may have an example of how you can solve the problem. Once you finish with your research, you're gonna move into the farm part of the doctor farm. And basically all four of these steps are worked on simultaneously. And that's function, appearance, risk, and model, as in 3D model. Function basically means how does your design actually solve the problem? And you wanna be sure that all the functions that are there are essential to solving the problem, that you're not gold plating as we call it sometimes in industry where you're adding features that aren't necessary. So how, what functions are do you need and do those functions specifically solve the problem? Appearance is just thinking through the shape, the geometry. Uh, is this geometry strong enough? You know, does it meet the, the needs of my design in terms of visual appearance? You know, is it attractive if that is an important feature for you? You know, on and on. Risk is just thinking through all the ways that this thing might fail. And then thinking about it that way, it helps me to hone in on where all the weaknesses are in my design, where might it break, what circumstances might cause this thing to fail, and then I can you know, try to address the risk as I'm designing the model. And that's the last part, thinking through the actual 3D model and how this thing will be fabricated. Because again, those two things come together. As you are designing it, you need to also think about uh, if it needs to be welded, if it needs to be machined, you know, how is the, the welder going to place that weld? Can they even get their hands in there? So you want to think through uh, all of the appearance, the geometry, the 3D model. Again, you can see how these ideas are sort of married together. You work on them all at the same time. Basically what I do is I pull this one forward and down just a little bit so that I can touch it and then push the keyboard out of the way, bring this forward and then I'm pretty much ready to go. I'm usually also recording the screen so that I can capture my work with the 3D model and switch back and forth. So you can see the keyboard is completely covered up. It's not accessible right now, but I have a button here that bring up the touch keyboard. And so if I absolutely need something from the keyboard, I can type in numbers, for example, which is usually the only thing I need. And then I can get rid of that. So I can control this with touch, but I usually control it with my 3D mouse. And of course I use the other touch input device for Adobe Premiere Pro. So I've got everything that you can imagine pre-programmed. And again, if I really need the keyboard, I can bring up the touch keyboard. This part is by far the most demanding part for the PC. I've got Premiere open with the full project going. I've got SOLIDWORKS going in the background with my 3D model. I'm recording the whole 4K screen so that I can show you snippets of what's happening there. If I do this for a couple of hours, I can actually feel the space around my feet warming up as the PC is blowing that hot air out of the back and heating up the space underneath my desk. It's not so hot anything will catch on fire or anything silly like that. It's, everything is fine. I just think it's interesting that I can actually feel the PC working as hard as I'm working. Of course, the work is not really done at the PC until the whole project is done. So I'm constantly switching back and forth between working in the shop, working at the PC, until the whole thing is recorded and uh, I hit the upload button. So basically, that's how the sausage is made. <laughs> other than the more detailed engineering stuff, which I covered really well in the other video. So I didn't want to repeat myself too much here, but I will go ahead and put a link to that video right down here so that you can go to that video next. I strongly recommend you check it out. Thank you HP for supporting this video and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.